There's no happy medium. <laughs> we'll go with this one for now. I guess I'll just be really red. <laughs> What's up everybody, welcome back to my channel here. Um, I like to talk about fitness stuff, document my transition as a black trans man, and do product reviews. Um, I will be doing the second of the two today, documenting my transition as a black trans man. For most of you, you know that I have been working on getting phalloplasty, as well as hysterectomy, um, my bottom surgery stuff all squared away. And today I am happy to bring to you guys my actual footage from my consultation with the Crane Center, Dr. Richard Santacuti, who will be over my surgery. Um, and he's just answering my questions, telling me how the staging will work out and things of that nature. Um, but I'm not gonna talk too long. I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you do and you wanna see more content like this, please subscribe and hit the bell notification so you guys can stay up to date on when I post videos. But without further ado, let's roll that clip. Um, none that I know of. Um, the only thing off the top of my head is that um, in the past for top surgery, I did keloid, so that is my my biggest concern in that sense. But outside of that, no, I'm not like allergic to anything, or I haven't had any like complications in the past. Let me say, I've got, you, I've got you down as allergic to Motrin or ibuprofen. Yes. Is that not true? No, that is true, yes. <laughs> what happens when you get Motrin? Um, I was a child when I first had it. I haven't had it since. Um, but when I was a child, I would swell up and I would get hives. Okay, that's good enough for me. Um, so, no Motrin for you. <laughs> And, you know, the hypertrophic scarring, you know, is, I don't know how to characterize it. It's not a reason not to do it. It might put you at higher risk for difficulties with the urethra. Okay. Uh, that's my best. But, but the, you know, there's a big word there, which is might. We just don't know that much about it. But in general, you know, you'll have a slightly higher chance of a urethra problem, I think is fair to say. But it's not a reason not to do it. And some of my patients who tell me, oh yeah, I'm a prominent scar former, they don't have any scar problems with this one, you know? Uh, so that's, you know, it's not a very strong statement. Um, uh, okay, cool. And then any previous surgeries on the top surgery? Uh, no, not at this current <laughs> moment. Good. And are you still using nicotine? Um, so I do not use nicotine, um, but I do smoke marijuana, um, pretty yeah, regularly. That's okay. Believe it or not, that's okay. That's, you know, the, the, it's the nicotine that narrows down your blood vessels super efficiently and, uh, it really does kill complicated flaps like this. And so it's not just me being a, like grandma, I'm like, no, smoke. That's, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, you know, sometimes we literally lose a phallus because someone keeps smoking. So, all right, so it sounds like if you're not using nicotine, that's cool. Um, all right, dude, why don't you ask me your questions then? Cool. Um, so, I guess I would like to know more on how um, the staging would occur. So, since I'm coming from out of state, I'm hoping to, I know you guys will, you know, put multiple surgeries together. Um, I just wanted to know what that would look like if I got, sure. you know, all of them done at one time and then, you know, went forward. Yeah, we're the one stage people. So, you know, we're the, uh, this is going to sound DC, but I just have to say it. I mean, we're the busiest transgender center in the world. So we've done about 850 polyplasties. We're going to do six just these two weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so 
we, we sort of are always honing, you know, what we're doing and trying to get it better. And so we've worked it out that we think the best way to do this is in one stage. So we, uh, we're going to remove the vagina, lengthen the urethra, make a scrotum, make a phallus, make a gland if we can. Usually we can. Okay. Uh, all in the first stage. And then if you don't have any complications, then we put in a penile prosthesis and testicle prosthesis eight months later. And okay. that's it. Good places, like NYU is a good example. NYU is a good place, like they know what they're doing. We know those people personally, we think they're great surgeons. And they do sort of this crazy four stage thing that I must admit to you, I don't fully understand. <laughs> All right. I don't know why they do it. <laughs> uh, so some smart people have looked at this and said it's four stages and we looked at it and said, nah, it's one or two stages. All right. And then um, I think you guys, you guys also have gland implants as well I was interested in that as well would that be done at the same time as the penile no, implant? Let's, let's talk about that so the, the gland implants are not good uh, I know people are super excited about them okay. but uh, so here's the role of, of how glands plasties kind of work so we're going to make you a good glands coming out of the box and mm-hmm. then in you know a maybe 50% of the time, that looks great. You know, it's good. You don't need anything more. Sometimes the glands will flatten. And the right answer then is to have a kind of a redo glansplasty. And we can do that at the same time we put in a penile prosthesis. So you get to the nine months mark and you're like, hey, not happy with glands, we should redo it. A glands implant is a sort of Hail Mary pass operation that we do for people that have had two glansplasties and they just flattened out Mm -hmm. despite all of our efforts and then we'll put a glans implant in but they're not great they erode they infect um we did a study where we looked back at all of our glans implants patients and 20 percent of people would have recommended it to a friend that's not very good (laughs) (laughs) all right good good to know so it's more like a last resort type thing it's a last resort thing yeah um, and then I did watch the video, but I did just want to confirm again the complication rates. Sure, yeah. Well, let's talk about that. So I'll, I'll monologue a little bit about that. So to me, the scariest complication, it's pretty rare, about 1%, is a blood vessel problem. So, you know, there's a moment in that surgery where we use a microscope and tiny little suture, smaller than your hair, to soak the arteries and the veins. And that artery is the size of a spaghetti strap. I mean, it is not big. Uh, And if those things decide to clot off, there's nothing you or I can do about it, uh, Mm -hmm. except react. And so we're sort of set up kind of like the fire department. We're waiting for that to happen. And we can go half a year or more and not, you know, not see it. Uh, we're gonna, we, you know, we've got bedside nurses that are super experienced with phalloplasty, so they're watching you. We're watching you. We got a second team of internal medicine doctors looking over our shoulder, so we're we're watching you. And then we have a special, uh, for lack of a better term, laser. It's not really a laser, but laser uh, monitor on your phallus, and it tells us how much oxygen is going to your phallus at any moment. So if that thing has a clot at 2.30 in the morning, boom, we know it. It actually alarms on our phones. And in that case, there's two surgeons at all times who are the designated, like, take you back to the operating room surgeons, Mm -hmm. and we will crash you back to the operating room and fix it. Um, For you, it's hectic. We're like, sign here, go to sleep, come on, we're having surgery. You know, like, (laughs) it's not going to be, it's not going to be great. But in doing it that way, we've been able to salvage most of those, you know, disasters. Mm -hmm. So we have a disaster, we go back quickly, we fix it, ah, all better, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, that to me is the the full story on, you know, the 1% uh, major vessel complication. The next set of complications is, and you know, you're a healthy 23 year old, so you won't have a lot of like, the rest of your body complications. You know, if you were sick and 60, you know, you might, doing a big surgery on you might cause pneumonia or other problems. You probably won't have those, Um, but it's the same scenario. Mm -hmm. We stare at you, we wait for you to 
get a complication. If you do, we react to it. So you might get, I'll just give you an example, and this hasn't happened in, gosh, more than a year and a half maybe, mm. uh, where where you're laying in bed, you're not breathing very deeply, uh, you get a pneumonia, and in that case we're like, oh, look, he's got pneumonia, and then we treat you and you get better. So the, the second category is just sort of perioperative problems not having to specifically do with your surgery. Okay. So the third classification of problems is urethra. And urethra is the Achilles heel of this whole surgery. So there is a solid 40% chance that you're gonna develop a problem with your urethra. Mm -hmm. Um, That could be a, a, a fistula, so that's an abnormal opening in the side. And it's funny, but, but fistulas are just annoying. Mm-hmm. You know, they're only annoying. You know, basically what you do is we'll heal up uh, at least six months, and then when the tissues have sort of recovered, then we go ahead and fix that for you. The bigger problem will be stricture. So that's a build up of scar tissue in your urethra. We're gonna build you, gosh, at least 10 inches, maybe 12 inches of new urethra. Mm-hmm. And if any point along that way, the tissues that we use to make your new urethra decide to give up the ghost, then they'll narrow and then you can't pee. So what that looks like is you're back home and then you're like, man, I just can't pee too good. And almost assuredly, you'll have to come back here uh, and uh, have a fix that because it's hard to get that fixed locally. Okay. Um, and then let me finish by saying, I think the headspace to be in is look, this is massive surgery. It's probably 20 person hours of surgery. Um, it's, you know, three surgeons working on you diligently for six straight hours, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. eight, five body spaces. And so we say, well, something's gonna go wrong. You know, you're gonna pop a secure up in here or there or get some redness that we say, hmm, is that an infection? You know, let's treat that. So uh, in that way, I think the, co- the total complication rate is probably 100%. Um, but, but, you know, our job is to watch you closely and help you with those things. You won't be, you know, alone for that. And then the final, final thing I'll say is it's a bit of a fib, meaning we actually get people coming through here all the time without a millimeter out of place. But it's the way to, it's the way to bed, you know, right. <laughs> it's the way but, to put your head. Right, better safe than sorry. <laughs> Right, right. Well, you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best, whatever. What else can I tell you? Um, is it, um, because you did mention I would be hooked up and everything like that. What is the, um, kind of length of stay I would be looking at? I'm assuming it's inpatient. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I'm assuming, <laughs> it's a pretty good solid guess. <laughs> no, we just let you, we just hand you some gauze rolls and send you out. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so this is what, let me, let me actually uh, answer more than just your question. So uh, the way that the whole process works beginning to end is we wait for your letters of support. So do you think you'll have any trouble getting us the two letters from mental health professionals um, from the hormone provider? That is actually already sent over. Wow, okay, you're way ahead of the thing. So <laughs> once we have the letters, and that may be now, then we can look at our schedule and say, oh, we're booking about seven months into the future. Okay, what do you think about May 1 or whatever? Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you say, yes, May 1 is good. And so then we approach Blue Cross Blue Shield. So it's your surgeon's responsibility to get pre-authorization for surgery. Um, And usually they win. You know, maybe 2% of the time they have a problem. The rest of the time, if we have letters and insurance, we're pro- it's probably going to happen, mm-hmm. uh, which is great. Um, so now we get close to the time of surgery. You're going to come here, and we're going to see each other face to face. Usually on a Friday, um, you'll also meet the internal medicine doctors that we use to co-manage. Okay. Uh, and then Monday, most likely, you'll have your surgery. Uh, and then for three of those days, you're in the intensive care unit. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, so it's, you know, it's very acute one-on-one type care with a, with a nurse. Um, and then that Saturday, uh, five days later, uh, you'll be discharged from the hospital. Okay. And then you see me in clinic each of the next three Wednesdays. 
So all in all, you're looking at about a month. All right. What else can I tell you? Um. So I have heard a lot about this, but I haven't looked too much into it. Um, I can't pronounce it right. In Integra. Oh, Integra. Integra. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. That's a great subject. Uh, so, and I'll tell you a little bit about nerves too, because nerves is a happy subject. Um, so Integra is this thin sheet of stuff that what we would do is we would. So when we take the flap from your arm, we make the phallus and everything, and then when it's ready, we move it on over. Then we use the natural elasticity of the remaining arm skin to kind of make that wound as small as possible. We sort of pull it in to make it smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we generally put a skin graft on that. Uh, and then you have something called a wound vac which is a weird saran wrap type dressing that just stays on there. Uh, and it's a little bit of a little vacuum in there and kind of sucks the air out. And it's good because it, it helps you, uh, it helps you um, keep the, uh, the graft taking well and stuff like that. And you'll have that while you're in the hospital and we'll take it off right before you leave. Some people elect to do Integra. So it's Integra down, then skin graft. Um, I think Integra is better. I think you get less step off, although you won't have a lot of step off because you don't have a lot of body fat. Mm -hmm. I think you get less it's sort of adherence to the tendons and things like that underneath. Um, and you get a little plumper, more natural result. So I think it's better. Now here's the question. Insurance companies don't cover for Integra. Okay. So a piece of Integra costs $12,000. I mean, it costs more than platinum, you know? We talked to the company and we said, come on, you know, $12,000. And they said, fine, $6,000. So the question is, and that's basically, since insurance is not going to cover, that's like out-of-pocket expense for you. Right. So the, so the question is, is it $6,000 better? I think it isn't. You know, would I spend six thousand dollars on what I know of my own money to buy Integra? No, I wouldn't. Good to know. Um, <laughs> it's just not that good. It might be a little bit better. And then let me sorry say one more thing about that. So I use kind of a thick graft. You know, I try to take a little bit thicker the graft than average. And I want to tell you that the last three RFFs I did, like, you know, someone I saw, like two I saw today, maybe one I saw last week, if you had tricked me and told me they had Integra, I would say, yeah, see how good it looks? You know, <laughs> they didn't have Integra. <laughs> so, so I'm just going to say that, like, the last no Integra patients, I don't know, they healed up pretty damn good without anybody losing 6000 bucks. So, lots of words, but I hope... It's clear what I'm thinking about that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so then, um, just because I do want to add, this is all something that I've always wanted to know. So because I'm like very fitness oriented, I'm kind of leaning more towards doing bodybuilding. So my body weight and like body fat percentage will be fluctuating. Is it better? for me to plan to have a lower body fat percentage the closer to surgery or like right now I put myself at like 15%. So I wouldn't like probably stay away from anything too higher than like 20 or like what's, what would you recommend? You're already going to be the skinniest patient we operate on this year. <laughs> so, so your BMI is 24, but this is America. So my patients routinely have a BMI 34 and that's a lot heavier than you are so you're already for us quite skinny the only thing i'm going to caution you against is mm -hmm. that if you lose too much arm fat then what you've got as a phallus is a envelope of skin with nothing in it empty okay. envelope so you know my measurement for you would be do i have a couple millimeters of fat on my arm or not <laughs> so okay. just don't get so skinny you lose your arm fat 
Okay, that's a good way to think about it. <laughs> yeah. And you can gain as much muscle as you like. That's not going to hurt you. It might even help you. But what I don't want you to do is lose a lot of body fat so we just got an empty skin envelope. You won't be happy with that. All right. Um, and then uh, f uh, who would be doing the microsurgical components of the surgery? Yeah, so it's a great question because I think they're the most important people. Sure, you're talking to me, but, but if your micro team is good, your phalloplasty is good. So uh, we use a two-person team, a guy named Galen Walkman, uh, sort of a superstar, did the first six hand transplants. He's a not, he's a no screwing around guy. Also a very nice person too. Uh, and another guy named CJ Langevin who has like, I don't know, four advanced degrees or something. I mean, these people are just crazy. They make me look like a chimpanzee, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and you know, I was saying to Galen, Galen is a modest person. And I said to him the other day, Hey, I think you've done more of these than anyone in the world. And he looked down at the floor and said, probably, you know, so the truth is, uh, I, I mean, maybe there's an equivalent team in America, but there's definitely no better team. And I can say that with confidence, even if it sounds douchey. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll, if you're confident in the team, I'm confident. <laughs> yeah, no, no, they're really terrific. Yeah. Um, and then just um, for knowledge and for whoever ends up watching, um, what would you say the sensation difference might be between RF and ALT? Mm. Such a good question. Let's talk about sensation in, in, in general. So what we're going to do as part of that, an important part of that operation is painstakingly tease out the nerve that goes to the skin of, of your arm. And then when the phallus gets transferred, an important step is that we borrow one of the sexual nerves on top of the clitoris. Now you've got several of them, five or six maybe. So I'm just gonna borrow one and I'm gonna hook it up using a microscope to that arm nerve. And then a miracle occurs, uh, meaning that the nerve roots actually sprout into, into the phallus. And about 80% of our patients have sexual sensation in the new phallus, which is kind of neat, if you ask me. Um, now, another 15% of people have only light touch sensation. So right now, if you touch your arm, you can feel it, but it's hardly sexy. And we, we do not know why that is. Uh, same nerve hookup, same nerve, same everything. And sexual sensation at 80%, but another 15% just light touch. In a very disturbing turn, about 5% of people get no sensation. Um, and that's very annoying uh, because everything, you know, it's disappointing for patient and doctor when that happens. Um, oh, and then, you know, we do everything to try and maximize that. Like mm -hmm. we stabilize the uh, connection with, by using special biological glue and, you know, do everything that's reasonable to do. Mm -hmm. Um, did that answer your question? Um, slightly. Uh, <laughs> no, you're good. It was definitely a good rundown. Um, but is there so? Is there any difference between? Oh, sorry. Our first leg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. So in theory, the arm has a higher nerve density than the skin of your thigh. Um, mm -hmm. Like you can measure that using a microscope. We simply haven't seen, though, that it makes a huge difference. Okay. So when we hook up the arm, people do well. When we hook up the leg, people do well. You know, we just don't see that there's a huge difference there. But, you know, you're picking arm, and so there's a reason why people call the arm the gold standard, and you should expect that you'll, you've got the best choice for, for, for good sensation later. All right. Good to know. Um, and then... By chance, since we're we're talking about this, um, by chance, if I decide to, you know, switch to ALT, like, is do I need to let you guys know by a certain time period, um, just so you guys have planning time? Like, obviously not the day of, but. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. So one of the last thing on your to-do list is hair removal. So do you have a lot of uh, body hair? 
I am actually a very hairless person. I actually have no hair on my arms, so. Oh, well, that's going to help. So, <laughs> you, you know, one of the things that I ask everyone to do is to do, you know, hair removal because what we don't want is the hair to grow on the inside of your urethra. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why people do hair removal. So it sounds like for your arm, you might be the kind of person that just elects not even to do hair removal. Um, yeah. What about your leg? Do you have hair there? So, yeah, I have s slightly more hair. <laughs> so, again, I'd be afraid that, you know, what you don't want is hair inside the urethra because it kind of grows unfettered and kind of makes a tangle and it can, you know, block your urination. Mm -hmm. So if you came in, if you came in and, and switched on us and said, oh, by the way, I'm doing leg, we'd probably be okay with that, meaning, you know, we can we can switch that quickly but have you done hair removal you know right. so I think that I think that it really comes down to the hair removal idea let me ask you a quick question while I'm out on it well, how do you inject your testosterone where do you inject it uh thigh okay from from this moment on I want you to pick a thigh and stay away from the other thigh okay uh until you're absolutely sure you're not going to use ALP don't switch back and forth because, you know, each of those injections makes this, like, pea-sized scar in there, and it can be a real nightmare to do the operation with a lot of injections in there. All right. Good to know. I, I mainly inject in my right thigh anyways now. Um, okay. I haven't injected in my left thigh in quite some months. Cool. So we'll spare the left for, AL, for any future possible ALT. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, so now the real answer to your question is uh, you can decide to switch to leg just leave yourself some time to remove hair okay uh how much time do you have patients in the past normally how long has it normally taken i mean it's at least four months at least because you know you need to nail it the first time and then let the next crop that go back and nail it the second time to me i would consider that to be a minimum many people do lots more than that all right and then um do you have a specific hair removal technique that you guys prefer? Yeah, I, as I sit here, I can't tell you what's better. For the longest time, the urban legend was electrolysis was better than laser. Uh, now there's two studies that said, no, laser's better than electrolysis. <laughs> so, <laughs> because laser is faster, cheaper, easier, uh, I'd probably just do laser. Okay. Folks, folks with dark skin cannot do laser, or folks with really white hair can't do laser. It has to be dark hair on white skin. That's how laser works. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if you go for laser, they might say, dude, this is not going to work, and they'll switch you over to electrolysis. Okay, good to know. Um, I guess the only last thing that I have, the last question would be, is there anything um, that I should let my histo hysterectomy surgeon know about? Like, hey, like, try and stay sure. away from this or anything like that? Yeah. You know, Morgan, these are such great questions. So I'm going to answer two different ways. The simplest way is say, please do my hysterectomy and just do, do, do what they do. Mm -hmm. um, they get very, some of them get really enthusiastic to follow our in instructions and some of them get very freaked out when we give them instructions. So <laughs> if you think you can, you can tell them, hey, uh, shorten the vagina a little bit. Don't spare the vagina. They're always going to spare as much of the vagina as possible because of that's what their patients want. But in our case, we're gonna remove the vagina and if they can easily, while they're doing it, take out the upper third of the vagina, they should. Okay. Only if it's easy, only if they want to, you know. I get these panic calls, I've never done that. Okay, don't do that. Just do it the way you always do it, you know. <laughs> and I had the opposite, I had a uh, doctor call me and say, well, I can remove the whole vagina. I'm like, please do not remove the whole vagina. It's gonna really screw us up. Like, just if you can remove a couple centimeters of the upper vagina, that'll make for an easier day for me and Morgan in the future. Mm -hmm. All right. What else can I say, Morgan? Um, oh, actually, I missed one. Uh, what techniques do you guys use to repair the fistulas and uh, strictures? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it is not going to be realistically possible for me to answer that question. I mean, my stricture toolkit must have 25 or 30 different operations in it. Mm -hmm. um, so 
it could be that we just have to cross that bridge when we come to it. Fistula repairs are very straightforward. You have a hole, we need to fix the hole. So most fistula repairs are about the same. You know, close over the hole and put a lot of layers over top of it and hope that it holds. And, you know, no matter who you are or what you do, fistulas can have about a 20% failure rate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very frustrating truth. Stricture, it just really depends on length and location. Um, but anyway, they're a big, big toolkit for strictures, and we have to just sort of individualize treatment. But sometimes we cut the bad part out and put the two cadets together. Sometimes we do a staged approach. Sometimes we use buckle graft. That's mouth graft. Uh, it just depends. All right. Uh, that was my last question. Good. Yeah, that was very useful. So uh, let me just reiterate your to-do list. So letters, but you took care of it. Hair removal, but you may not need it. <laughs> <laughs> Hysterectomy, you definitely need it. Um, and, you know, uh, once you, they, they, they really won't schedule you until you have the hysterectomy. Um, so I think that's the real uh, limiting step for you because it sounds like you've already got letters. All right, cool. Um, so I was actually waiting to know when my surgery date would be so that I could plan my hysterectomy appointment like within a good time. Cause I'm trying to keep, make sure it's all falls within the, my insurance year. So yeah, we're, we're eager to help you with that. And that may or may not work. Okay. So the truthful answer is you probably need to get a hysterectomy <laughs> and then give us a call and we'll get you in probably you know, seven months from then. Okay. I mean, that's probably the realistic answer. Sounds good. You know, we love to, to game it so that you don't have to pay your deductible that year twice and blah, blah, blah. But truthfully, there's so many moving parts here that we sometimes can't make that happen. All right. Sounds good. All right, Morgan, this is a pleasure to speak to you. And, you know, what I've done today is make a really thorough medical record. That was all those awkward pauses. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you get around to your end of it, you're in here. So we've got you, and we'll just pick up the thread where we left off uh, at the next step. Okay? All right, sounds good. All right, thanks, and nice talking to you. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. So that is it, guys. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. That was my consultation with... Um, Dr. Richard Sentkuti, uh, I swear I'm saying his name wrong, so sorry. <laughs> uh, Richard Sentkuti of the Crane Center in Austin, Texas. If you did like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Comment down below if you have any other questions. Um, hopefully, I you know, was able to answer some things, um, but it is my consultation. So a lot of it was geared towards myself um, as an individual. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, subscribe, hit the bell notification so you guys can stay up to date on when I post videos. Um, and as you guys know, it is your boy, Matt Turner. I hope you guys have a great morning, evening, day or night, wherever you are. And I will see you guys next time.